<laughs> okay, so thanks everyone for tuning in to this um, quantum gravity information seminar. Um, today, we're very happy to have Rob Myers from Perimeter Institute telling us about uh, quantum extremal islands made easy. Rob, thank you very much and take it away. Okay, thank you, Ro. It's a pleasure to be here today and I hope everybody's uh, taking care in these unsettled times. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that this is a project that I'm doing with four smart people listed here. There's uh, Vincent Chen, a student here, uh, Dom uh, Newtonfeld, who's a postdoc with us, Ignacio Reyes, who's actually a postdoc at uh, AEI, and Josh Sandor, another uh, student here. And I should add, oh dear, okay. And the screen is frozen. But well, hopefully we'll have some papers out in the near future. In any event, anyone who's seen me give a talk in the recent times, meaning the past decade, will realize this is my favorite slide, uh, talking about holographic entanglement entropy. And it's been a very fruitful hey, uh, tool. It's Rob? provided a forum where we've really had an interesting dialogue between the bulk and the boundary in holography. And we've learned new things about quantum field theory. And at the same time, we're learning new things about quantum gravity. And this is a, a setting now where, in fact, we're getting insights into the black hole information paradox. And so I just wanted to remind everybody what the question there was. This was pointed out already by Hawking uh, shortly after he realized that black holes uh, radiate and carry energy away from black holes. He realized that you could start with a pure state, a pure quantum state, that could produce a collapse, produce a black hole, but then the radiation, uh, well, carries the energy away, and at the end of the day, one's left with uh, what looks like a thermal bath of radiation, and there's nothing to purify that anymore, and so one, it seems that one's gone from a pure state in the past to a mixed state in the future and so this is a, a violation of the basic rules of quantum theory and so there's been a real puzzle there uh, that's been a fruitful thing to study um, how do i characterize that in a in a in a framework where we're we're talking about entropies well what we can do is we can consider the entropy carried by the radiation uh, originally, there is no radiation, but it slowly builds up, and as the radiation, more and more radiation is emitted, more and more uh, entropy builds up until the end of the process. There's no more evaporation. There's a fixed amount of radiation, and so that entropy uh, caps out. And so this is indicating I've gone from zero entropy to a mixed state with some finite entropy uh, at in the end of the process. However, Don Page pointed out that that, uh, well, he was the one who, who highlighted the, this uh, curve or this uh, feature as a, a contradiction with unitarity. And he argued that in fact, in a unitary theory, well, the radiation uh, or the entropy in the radiation should increase until about half the evaporation time. But after that, there should be information leaking out of the black hole and the, the entropy of the radiation should be decreasing so that it returns down to zero at the end of the process. Now, this is really the context in which we're going to be discussing uh, the, the new developments. Um, and so, you know, those, Insights really came, well, with the top two papers last spring by Jeff Pennington and then the uh, uh, Almeri, Engelhart, Marl, Maxfield, which we're looking at a, a, a slightly different system that I'll describe in a moment. But then there was also some uh, insights that I'll refer to that came from uh, Almeri, Majin, Maldesena, and Zoe, where they added another level of holography in, in August last year. Um, since then, there's been a whole stream or, or a collection of papers and all sorts of authors have uh, contributed to this area uh, or these ideas. And my apologies to anyone in the audience who uh, whose name doesn't explicitly appear in this list. 
Uh, but let's focus on uh, the second of these papers. What's the model they were talking about? Well, it was a, a simple two-dimensional uh, uh, holographic model. And so on the right, what I have here is a two-dimensional CFT on a half line. Uh, this is a moment in time, and so there's also time in the picture. And that's coupled to two quantum mechanical systems, um, which have the property that they're actually holographic. And so those two quantum mechanical systems are prepared in a thermal field double. And so the holographic description then of the, the quantum mechanical systems is some kind of ADS2, which has a certain kind of gravity, JT gravity, which I'll comment on in a, in a moment. But then the brain also supports a copy of uh, the same matter fields that appear in the bath um, or, or in the flat space region on the right hand side. Um, again, just a reminder to those uh, who, well, it, hopefully most of the people already uh, understand this, but uh, Jaki Teitelbaum gravity. Um, Remember that the Einstein-Hilbert uh, term is topological in two dimensions, and so this actually doesn't generate any uh, useful equations of motion. And what appears in this version of gravity is I've introduced an extrascalar field, the dilaton, which couples to uh, the, the Ricci scalar uh, minus a cosmological constant term. And this kind of, or, or this, uh, can be seen as a dimensional reduction of the gravity in the vicinity of extremal horizons, but it's also come into, uh, well, uh, intense scrutiny because it's also seen as being the holographic dual, or at least the low energy sector of a certain, um, uh, well, uh, random or ensemble of theories known as the uh, SYK or Sachdev Yi Katayev uh, model. Uh, but I wanted to remind you or highlight that, uh, uh, well, okay, we're going to couple this gravity in our setting to a CFT with a large number of degrees of freedom. They're only really going to, those uh, CFT degrees of freedom are only going to know about the metric. There's no direct coupling to the dilaton. But when I look at black holes in this theory, we also have to remember that when I integrate out the dilaton, basically the Ricci scalar is fixed. That means the entire geometry is fixed. And so locally everywhere, what we have is an ADS2 geometry. And so when I'm talking about a black hole here, I'm really talking about a certain coordinate system, or I might be talking about a Jaki or a topological black hole. This is really just ADS2 uh, geometry with a certain coordinate system here so that there's a, uh, the, a horizon appears. The most interesting part uh, or the dynamics of the theory, of course, comes from the dilaton, which has in this particular background a, a non-trivial profile that's given here. Now, usually when we're doing holography in the past, uh, we think of the ADS boundary as having reflecting boundary conditions. And so, Typically, what happens if I form a black hole is it would settle into some kind of equilibrium. And what the insights of these uh, two groups at the top of the page were is what well, we can change the boundary conditions and we can allow the Hawking radiation to leak out into, uh, in this uh, setting, into the region that I'm calling the bath or the two dimensional CFT on a half line. And then what uh, what's produced is an evaporating black hole because the energy is leaking or the Hawking radiation is leaking out of our holographic system. And in that context, uh, what they did is they studied uh, the gravitational entropy, but they didn't do it using the usual Ru Takianagi formula, which you would use in a holographic in the ADS2 setting, but rather they used uh, these so-called quantum extremal surfaces where I'm not just extremizing uh, the, the geometric term introduced by gravity, but also contributions from the quantum fields. And so if I go back to our ADS2 black hole, if I was looking 
at a particular time slice on the boundary, which is just a point in our uh, one plus one system here, uh, or the quantum mechanics is just a, a, a one plus zero dimensional system, the Rue Takianagi surface would just be the bifurcation surface. That would be what I would get by extremizing the geometric term, which here is the dilaton, the dynamical dilaton over 4G. But when I'm thinking about quantum extremal surfaces, what I would be looking at is my, my tentative or my candidate uh, extremal surface. I'd evaluate this geometric quantity there, but then I'd also evaluate the entanglement entropy of the quantum fields on a Cauchy surface extending from this extremal surface in the bulk to my time slice on the boundary. I've shown a couple of different Cauchy slices here, but they're all anchored on the same boundary slice and the same uh, bulk slice or point. And the entanglement entropy of the matter fields isn't going to care which one of those Cauchy slices I pick. On the other hand, if I move the red dot around, I'm moving to another class of uh, Cauchy slices. And so in that sense, uh, the matter fields, the, the contribution of the matter field is going to change. And so following these authors here, the instruction is to extremize the combination of both of those together. Um, and the claim is that in this particular setting, I reproduce something that looked like uh, a page curve. And in fact, you can draw graphs like this where I, the system goes through various phases. Um, there's an initial transient phase when you change the boundary conditions and join the bath to the quantum mechanical system. Um, there's a growth phase where uh, the entropy starts or the radiation starts leaking into the bulk. And I find that, uh, uh, well, as predicted by uh, Hawking's original calculation, the entropy is growing. But then there's a new class of quantum extremal surfaces that come into play. And in fact, towards the end, the entropy starts to decline. And so that's like the page uh, phase of the, of the evolution. Um, and I should say that in this stage of the evolution, um, in fact, I, it seems that the bath has information about the interior of the black hole, and this brings up the topic of quantum extremal islands. But I'm not going to really get into any of the details of this particular system or the, you know, what went into producing that graph or the extremal islands um, for the moment. Um, I'm going to move on to the suggestion of these folk uh, from August, which was to say, well, I can also think about a special case of this system where rather than picking any old two-dimensional CFT, I'll pick a holographic uh, CFT. And in that case, there's another layer of holography where the two-dimensional CFT gets represented now by an uh, three-dimensional anti desitter space. And in that setting, there's also, uh, you know, one has to introduce something known as end-of-the-world brains. The quantum extremal or the uh, entanglement entropy or the entropies can be calculated using the Ru takianagi formula or the, the uh, humni ragamani takianagi formula looking for extremal surfaces uh, in the bulk. Some of those surfaces will end on uh, this uh, Planck brain or this brain that supports the JT gravity. And that endpoint then becomes the quantum extremal surface that we saw in the previous calculations uh, when we were working just with JT gravity and the, the 2D uh, matter system. Again, uh, you know, you get this kind of a picture and now there are bulk pictures that go along with each of these different phases where there are uh, different kinds of extremal surfaces in the bulk um, that uh, describe or are giving us uh, these values and it's really the competition between these different classes of surfaces uh, that's causing a transition between the different kinds of behaviors that we're seeing in that curve. Now 
that's giving us some really interesting new insights, but it's also raising a large number of questions. You know, one might wonder how important was it that we were working in these models with two dimensions? Um, this brain seems to be part of the boundary. is just um, ordinary Einstein gravity coupled to a negative cosmological constant. And I'm adding this brain with a certain tension, but I'm letting the, the brain back react on our system. Now, motivated by JT gravity, you might actually want to extend this, and we take some time eventually in our papers to extend this scenario to the case where we're going to add a gravitational term on the brain, and that modifies the story a little bit. But for today's purposes, I'm going to forget about that, um, and we're just going to think about the simple Randall syndrome scenario with an action that's given by these two pieces here. Now, one of the things one could do in the back reactive geometry is integrate out the bulk. And what one's left with then, or one realizes that uh, this new massless graviton mode uh, that's localized on the brain is described by an induced action. And that action takes this form here. So it's living on a d-dimensional brain, or it's localized on the d-dimensional brain, so it's a d-dimensional action. G tilde here is the induced metric on uh, the brain. There's an effective uh, gravitational coupling on the brain, and there's an effective uh, cosmological constant on the brain. There's an Einstein term here, of course. And then there's a whole series of higher curvature terms as well. And I've just, as a metaphor, because I'll refer to it in a moment, said that here's an R squared term. But that's actually the first of a whole series of terms. The important part. Uh, that'll play a role in a moment is that the effective coupling or the scale that plays a role in all of these higher curvature terms is the bulk ADS scale, the capital L here. And so here are the formulas again for the, the effective Newton's constant or the induced Newton's constant on the brain and for the uh, cosmological constant or the ADS scale on the brain. And one of the things we're going to do though to make this a really effective description of the brain physics is we're going to tune uh, L effective to be huge, or this inverse is going to be much larger than the ADS scale uh, in the bulk. And as a result of that, when I evaluate the action, this is uh, the curvatures are uh, given by a scale that's essentially this effective uh, curvature scale. But that means then that when I look at R squared here, the relative or the relative uh, suppression of this term versus the Einstein term is an L, uh, an 80, a bulk L squared over the L effective squared. And so as long as I'm in this regime, I'm in a regime where I'm suppressing all of the higher curvature physics, and I can really think of the brain gravity theory as ordinary Einstein gravity. Now, I kept referring to uh, the geometry, the back reacted geometry. And so just a quick review, my, my dot here, is, or my circle here, my disk is a cross section of ADSD plus one. Um, what I'm doing though, is I'm going to foliate it with uh, surfaces, which themselves are ADSD. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the geometry at some, oops, oh well, at some large row. And so this green line here is a, a surface that has the geometry of ADSD. Um, and then I'm going to take two copies of that geometry and glue them together. 
I can use the Israel junction conditions. I look at the jump in the extrinsic curvature across that uh, green line in the bulk. And uh, that's given, well, Einstein's equations really dictate that that jump in the extrinsic curvature is given by the coupling of the, the brain tension T naught to our bulk gravity theory. Now, alternatively, what I can do is I can just take my effective gravity action and I can solve the equations of motion. The simplest solution there will be an ADSD with a particular curvature scale, namely L effective. And what you find is that that's essentially the same as the curvature that you derived before using this other approach. In fact, if you want to make it more precise, um, you can start solving uh, the equations of motion perturbatively, including the higher uh, curvature terms, and that produces a perturbative expansion in the ratio of these two uh, scales. But again, what you're doing is you're matching precisely using the gravity, you're, you're determining precisely the curvature scale of the brain, and what that then does is you can look here and you can determine what the position of the brain should be to realize that curvature scale. So we have either this bulk description or this brain description of uh, determining the geometry here. Um, I'll say though that, you know, while this is a, a nice picture, it takes a bit of work um, to draw something like that. And so I'll be lazy and I'll typically draw pictures like this where I just draw my cross section of ADS, and then I'll draw a green line through the middle saying that's where the brain is, but you should remember that there's a lot of extra geometry uh, hidden in the picture in the vicinity of our brain. One final comment here is that if I consider Ru Takinagi surfaces in the bulk, what you can verify is that there is a leading contribution coming from where the Rutakinagi surface crosses uh, the brain, which is given by what you expected from this induced gravity action. Namely, it's the Bekenstein Hawking formula, the area of the surface or the cross section of that surface on the brain divided by four times the effective Newton's constant in this action. Okay. So that is a lightning review of Randall syndrome. Uh, I haven't quite told you what I'm gonna do with it, but maybe I'll just pause and see if there are any questions because that lets me take a drink. Okay, we're all happy with Randall syndrome. Well, really um, what I wanna say is that this setup now gives me a framework in higher dimensions where I really have these three layers of, or three different descriptions of the system. As I described it, I was really working in what I call C here. I've got a bulk theory of uh, gravity in D plus one dimensions coupled to a brain and the brain geometry uh, in this simple setup, it turns out to be just an ADSD. Now, uh, ADS-CFT tells us that we have a holographic or a boundary description of that system. In the boundary description, I've got a holograph, a D-dimensional CFT. That CFT lives on a D minus one sphere uh, across time, but it's coupled to a conformal defect where effectively I have a D minus one dimensional CFT. And that's the position here as I set it up at the equator of my D minus one sphere, that's where the brain reaches out to the asymptotic boundary, oops, the asymptotic boundary of my ADS space. However, because of the weak coupling between uh, these two systems, I can think about just doing holography for the defect theory. And in that case, what I would have so I'd have my boundary CFT on the D, D minus one sphere, but it would be coupled to that same CFT in, uh, on an ADSD brain now uh, that extends, uh, well, through the middle of my, my picture there. 
Um, but I'll remind you that that CFT, or that this is an effective description, and uh, what Randall and Sundrum uh, instructed us is that that CFT comes with a cutoff, and that's really essential to the appearance of gravity in that particular version of the theory. But again, this A, B, and C, the three descriptions of the system, are really analogous to the three descriptions that I gave you before that really came from these two papers here. I've got a CFT in a non-gravitational uh, geometry here. It's a two-dimensional CFT. It's coupled to a particular quantum mechanical system or a defect. Here it's a boundary theory rather than just a, a defect. I can do holography for that quantum mechanical system that gave rise to the JT gravity with the CFT. Or I can do a full on um, holography for the CFT. And now this is the boundary of my ADS. Here's a, a, a brain. And they're uh, also living, well, on, on the edge of an ADS3 geometry. In my setup, there's no counterpart uh, to the end of the world brain. But the, what I want to emphasize is these three pictures of holography or the description of the system that I want to talk about are really analogous to these three systems here. Now, I promised you uh, evaporating black holes and page curves like that. Um, that was really a bait, and now here comes the switch. I'm actually going to consider a slightly different scenario uh, where the system's in thermal equilibrium. And so what are we doing there? Well, this was a suggestion by these folks in the fall. Uh, and there were actually two uh, similar papers that talked about uh, a very similar setup. But I'll focus on uh, the first paper here, which was really an extension of the 2D gravity and 1D quantum mechanics. So I want to prepare uh, the hartle hawking state for a 2D black hole. What is that? Well, we do, we draw the usual cigar, the Euclidean black hole, the usual cigar picture here. Our Euclidean time runs around uh, in the circle direction. There's a fixed point down here where the horizon used to be, um, but the, the temperature is given by the inverse period of that uh, particular circle or the inverse of the period. I want to couple that to a non-geometrical system. And so how do I do that? Well, I'm just going to take my two-dimensional CFT and put it on a thermal circle. Um, that, again, is going to prepare a thermal state for my two-dimensional CFT. In my picture, I've matched the periods of the two geometries and glued them together. And that's really saying that the temperature is the same in both of these systems. Now, I can make a slice through that. And what I can think is that, what that what's been prepared on that dotted line is uh, a hartle hawking state, or it's two highly entangled uh, copies of the CFT or, and the, the black hole uh, background. And so you can think about time evolving that state forward in Lorentzian time and what you would find in the gravitational region is the expected black hole. In the non-gravitational region, what you would get is the just empty, or not empty, you would get flat space, but now containing a thermal bath. You can also forget about this uh, cryptic uh, Euclidean part of the picture. I can just think of the Lorentzian geometry, and I can think that this hartle hawking state, that the 2D CFT is prepared in this hartle hawking state on that dotted line, cutting through the Lorentzian geometry, and I can think about evolving it forward or backward in time. Now, I said that this is a thermal equilibrium, and so you might think that there's no information paradox here. But in fact, um, these two systems, the black hole and the bath, are continuously exchanging radiation, and that does lead to a version of the information paradox and a version of the page curve, as I'll describe in a moment. But just to illustrate that, if we were thinking not about a strongly coupled CFT, but we were thinking about, say, modes in a, in a, in a uh, free field theory, we might have two correlated modes in the bath. Um, here on, 
Here on the right side, the, the mode just wanders off into the asymptotically flat region. On this side, the mode falls into the black hole and actually eventually disappears behind the horizon. Alternatively, I could do the opposite or I could consider the opposite. Here I have a mode that emerges uh, from the black hole and uh, wanders off into the bath on the left-hand side. Um, it's entangled with a partner over here on the right, but that partner is actually headed into the black hole and again disappears behind the horizon. And so in a context like that, in fact, because of that exchange, you might think that the entropy is increasing uh, with time and that it just continues to increase because this exchange uh, occurs for an infinite amount of time. But in fact, uh, what we expect is that the black hole can only store a finite amount of radiation or finite amount of information. And so, in fact, that curve should uh, be capped off. And at a certain point, the entropy should just be a fixed constant, which is roughly given by twice the entropy of the black hole. And in fact, um, what these three authors here did is they analyzed uh, this two-dimensional system and they found exactly this behavior. Um, in this first phase where the entropy is growing, I'll call that the growth phase. Um, if I'm looking at the entropy of these blue regions here, which are the large part of the bath, uh, what you find is that there are no extremal, uh, no extra extremal surfaces. And so it's essentially just the entanglement entropy of those two regions. And that entanglement entropy grows as it, uh, you know, modes are going back and forth between the black hole and the bath. On the other hand, at late times in what I'm calling the page, per page phase, where the entropy is capped off, what they found were that uh, there are new extremal surfaces that appear in the gravitational region. And that leads to this situation where the entropy then actually is just a fixed constant. Um, further, you know, this is now my first illustration of an island. I have this blue region that covers uh, the interior or its domain of dependence covers a part of the interior of the black hole. And so it seems that the, radi the bath radiation actually encodes part of the, or code some information about the interior of the black hole. I'll also add that in their paper, they noted that those quantum extremal surfaces actually appear in this setting outside of the black hole horizon, which seemed somewhat mysterious at the time. But if I have a chance, I'll, well, I'll comment on that uh, briefly uh, later on. So this is the, the scenario that I'd like to be able to recover, but I'd like to do it using the randall sundrum construction that I talked about for a general uh, uh, scenario in higher dimensions. And so what we had was our ADSD plus one gravity coupled to a brain, which had a, a simple ADS geometry. Um, one of the things you might remember is that empty, before I introduce the brain, the empty ADS space can be described as a hyperbolic black hole or a topological black hole, or often nowadays we call these the um, uh, the, the Rindler, Rindler ADS coordinates. In any event, here is the metric for empty uh, anti de Sitter space in a particular coordinate system. And in this conformal frame, what we're describing is a thermofield double state for the boundary CFT that lives on uh, a hyperbolic disk, a D minus one dimensional hyperbolic disk cross time. And it's at a very particular temperature uh, given by one over two pi r, where r is the curvature scale of our hyperbolic disk here. Now, I wanted to introduce the brain, and so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take that geometry and I'm going to stick a brain down the middle of it. Um, the same coordinates, uh, everything goes through as before, 
except now I'm describing the thermophile double of the boundary CFT coupled to this particular conformal defect at a particular temperature. And so this is going to be, well, this is a, a natural setting then for uh, a higher dimensional description of the system that I, or the, the physics that I was talking about for the page curve of in thermal equilibrium. In particular, our two dimensional story, what we had was this ADS2 black hole or this topological black hole two-dimensional ADS space, and then we had flat space where there was a thermal bath. Um, and that whole story lifts quite easily to D dimensions. Now my bath space uh, is time across the hyperbolic disk. The dimension of the ADS space here it has grown to D dimensions, but I also I have now a hyperbolic or a topological black hole in that particular background. One different, one small difference between these two is going to make some of the pictures perhaps a little more confusing is that in two dimensions, uh, this uh, two-dimensional CFT was actually living on a half line. Um, here I've got a full um, hyperbolic disk and the defect is going to be a slice through the middle of that disk. And you'll see that uh, in the pictures in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to point out, uh, well, here's my picture. So the R cross uh, HD minus one, the Penrose diagram looks essentially like the Penrose diagram for flat space. But now my topological defect runs through the middle of that space it's only uh, D minus one dimensions. And so this, is, this leaf is R cross a hyperbolic disk of one lower dimension. And remember, this was my uh, bulk uh, picture. And this diamond, if you like, is the diamond that lives between the edges on the boundary between the edges of these two orange disks on this side. And there's another copy of it because we have a thermal field double of that same diamond on the opposite side of my ADS boundary over here. Now let's think about the entanglement entropy problem that we might want to study. Well, we want to study the entanglement entropy of a large part of the bath. Um, so we're going to pick some uh, endpoint, some finite distance away from uh, the defect. And then I'm just going to let uh, the, the entanglement region stretch out to infinity in my hyperbolic disk. And remember, I've got two copies of that. Um, now, what I've drawn there is the t equals zero slice. So this is just the moment where I have that, I've, uh, the state that was prepared by my Euclidean path integral. But I can ask, how does, how does this geometry evolve uh, as time moves forward in this particular conformal frame? Well, the time, uh, the lines, uh, the timelines, the times, uh, yeah, the lines, the d by dt carries you along a, a, a line that like this, just like in, in flat space, if I start here some finite distance away from the middle of the diamond, uh, the line carries me up towards the, the, the point of the diamond at uh, infinite time, and the same on the other side. And so, what I'm going to ask is how the entanglement entropy evolves as I go to these different time slices as I move forward in time. Now, let's think about what this picture looks like um, when I'm wrapping it around the outside of my ADS geometry here. So one of these diamonds, if I look at the t equals zero slice, wraps halfway around uh, the ADS. So that's this purple line. And my blue or my endpoints are the black squares and the blue uh, regions uh, extend from there to the edge, oops, the edge of that um, uh, patch in the boundary. And then we have the same copy on the other side. And so that we can see that actually uh, those two or the ends uh, or our thermal bath actually run into one another between the two copies across this uh, Rindler horizon here. 
Um, now let's see what's happening as I have all forward in time. Uh, oops, the wrong way. Well, the points are moving towards the, the top of the diamond there. And so in the boundary of my ADS, those points are moving closer and closer uh, to the brain. Now we should remember these are all, you know, this is a two dimensional cross section. So these dots are living on different uh, time slices. But generally what's happening is, you know, I, had, I started with these two endpoints with a certain distance or separation from the brain, and they seem to be moving closer and closer uh, in this uh, particular picture. And so the point is that that picture now may be reminiscent of a more familiar scenario that we've been used to thinking about in holographic entanglement entropy. Namely, if I have uh, a, if I'm looking at the entanglement entropy of a region with two disjoint pieces, these two blue regions, when the blue regions only cover a small fraction of the total uh, area of the boundary uh, geometry, the entanglement surfaces are, uh, or the Rutakinagi surfaces are two disjoint uh, surfaces and the entanglement wedges only cover these small uh, pink regions here. However, if I choose the blue regions to be larger and larger, eventually I get this move, I get a phase transition and I move to this connected phase. And now the entanglement region can, uh, well, carries information uh, further into the, well, and covers the center of the, the ADS geometry now. And so what am I doing uh, in our construction? Basically, I'm taking the same picture and I'm sticking a brain in the middle of that picture. Um, there's also a horizon that runs around uh, in the geometry. And so I'll just, uh, to pick that with that dotted line. In this phase, in the disconnected phase, that corresponds to the early times. Uh, the Rutaki and Agi surfaces join opposite sides of the black hole. They, ex they extend from an endpoint in one bath to the nearest endpoint in the other, uh, in the thermofield couple or the thermofield double. Um, and as time goes uh, forward, the length of that surface is increasing and the entanglement entropy uh, increases. Uh, and this then with growing entanglement entropy is what I call the growth fit or we, we can call the growth phase. On the other hand, late times we get into this phase where it's, it's now what we might call the connected phase. The Rutakinagi surfaces extend uh, uh, from one endpoint to the other within a single copy of the CFT, and they in particular extend through the brain. Uh, because of the tricks of the conformal frame, it turns out that the entanglement entropy is actually fixed in time and it does not change. Uh, but the important part now is that the entanglement wedge includes this central region and includes uh, uh, information about the physics on the brain. Namely, I have a quantum extremal island from the perspective of the brain physics here. And this is then what we'll call, uh, well, what we call the page uh, phase in the earlier discussion. Um, I, I'd also like to uh, draw a comparison with the work that uh, Hartman and Maldacena did. And to do that, rather than thinking about the blue regions, let's think about the entanglement entropy of the complementary regions, the black regions here. In this case, what we have is we're asking for the entanglement entropy of a piece of uh, the thermal, or the one copy of the CFT, and a complementary piece or an identical piece in the thermofield double. And the Rutaki and Agi surface in this instance actually extends through the horizon. And as we evolve in time, the entropy grows. However, what we're used to thinking in that context is that the system rapidly thermalizes. The, uh, the surfaces stretch to the point where they snap and you get into this disconnected phase where each of these two regions just has a Rutaki and Agi surface 
that remains on one side of the horizon or the other. And so the physics that were, you know, the uh, Rutaki and Agi surfaces for those two different systems are uh, the same uh, surfaces that I described, well, that we had when we were talking about uh, the, the, the entropy of the bath. But in this context, it's that page curve is the behavior that we uh, expected already from this work of uh, Maldacena. Uh, and uh, Tom Hartman and Maldacena. Uh, another puzzle was that uh, the, in this context, was that these uh, quantum extremal surfaces are actually appearing outside of the horizon. Well, this, uh, ex thinking about it again in terms of the black region, this surface describes the entanglement region of a portion of uh, one side of the black hole. And so just by entanglement wedge nesting, this surface had to be outside the horizon because the entanglement entropy of the whole uh, CFT on one side of the black hole, that Rutakinagi surface is the horizon. And this is only a small part of that. And so I expect that uh, the Rutakinagi surface or the quantum extremal surface associated with it where it crosses the brain has to be outside of uh, the horizon. So what, what I've shown you is that this story that we, uh, or that, uh, well, actually their names have disappeared, Almeri uh, Majan and Maldacena told about uh, using two-dimensional JT gravity, you can reproduce it in any number of dimensions, uh, and you get exactly the same kind of uh, behavior. Now, I wanted, I guess I'm going to be running out of time, but I wanted to turn to some of the questions uh, that I raised before. In these pictures here that were drawn originally, the degrees of freedom uh, look like they're on the boundary of the picture. And so you might ask, you know, are the degrees of freedom here uh, boundary degrees of freedom or bulk degrees of freedom? Um, in our, uh, uh, well, in this doubly holographic model, you want to invoke uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction. But if these were both boundary degrees of freedom, you wouldn't say that one set of boundary degrees of freedom can be used to reconstruct other boundary degrees of freedom. However, I purposefully, uh, made a construction where the Planck brain or our brain um, is not on the boundary of the space, rather it runs through the middle of the space. And so it's clear in this construction, the brain degrees of freedom are actually part of the bulk. And that that is the usual entanglement wedge reconstruction when I say the degrees of freedom here in the bath carry information about the brain degrees of freedom or the black hole uh, interior. Um, of course, you could apply something like a Z2 orbifold and get rid of half of that picture. And now this would look like it's on the edge of the picture. And so I'd have the system, the kind of system uh, that was being studied with JT gravity or the two, in the two dimensional uh, case. Um, was two dimensions important? Well, Jeff uh, Pennington already uh, suggested that that was not the case in his work, but here, in our construction, it's very straightforward and it's all analytic and it's clear that, you know, we can do this in any number of dimensions. Um, that, that uh, yeah, two was not important. Was it important that it was JT gravity? Again, uh, no. In our cases, the brain gravity uh, is uh, described to a good approximation by Einstein gravity. Um, you know, was the ensemble average of SYK important? Again, I would say that the answer there is no. Um, and, you know, our construction is just uh, relying on the standard rules of ADS CFT. We're not averaging over coupling in the boundary CFT. Um, one uh, interesting question uh, might, or, or, or one thing that comes up is uh, this so-called notion of the island rule. And what these authors do when they're talking about that is they distinguish the full quantum description of the radiation 
from a semi-classical description where the state is prepared by some Euclidean path integral. And so one might ask, how is that manifest in, in the you know, discussion that I gave you today? Well, I gave you these three pictures. Now, ADS-CFT says that these two pictures are equivalent, the boundary description or the bulk description. And I would use the words that these provide a UV complete framework and they provide a full quantum description of the radiation. On the other hand, the randall sundrum description where I have my CFT uh, coupled to gravity uh, in, in some d-dimensional region here, um, one of the things that I emphasize but may have gone by very quickly is that it's clear that this is not a UV complete description of the physics. In fact, you know, Randall and Sundram were the first to emphasize that this CFT comes with a finite cutoff. It's at a very high energy scale, but it's at a finite energy scale. And so this is not a, a complete uh, picture or description of the physics. This is just an effective low energy framework. And so this is the framework then where we would say that there's a uh, semi-classical uh, description of the radiation and the Hawking partners uh, in the in the context of these folks here. Um, the last question I had is how is the information really leaking out? How is it encoded in uh, the Hawking radiation? You know, um, and well, this is more uh, just a. Uh, a point of view. I'm not going to answer that as I as I showed you before. The the answer is question mark question mark. But you know when we thought about the growth phase, uh, the remarkable thing there was that we discovered that Hawking radiation. We discovered the black hole entropy using smooth semi-classical saddle points, and it didn't really. It told us or hinted that there were a large number of uh, microstates, but it didn't tell us anything about the nature of those microstates. And that was ultimately then what led to the information paradox. Now, for a long time, or the expectation was that, well, to get the, the page phase or to get the curve to turn down or to cap off in this equilibrium situation, we were going to have to understand those microstates in great detail and we were going to understand the encoding of the information and the radiation and how it uh you know exactly moved out of the black hole but then the real surprise of uh the work uh in the past year is that in fact that was that expectation is not realized or is wrong you don't have to understand all of that microscopic detail. The page phase is described by saddle points as well. It's just another set of sat competing saddle points that dominate uh, the physics. But again, they don't reveal the details of the microscopic physics. And I have a few minutes left, so I'll just say, well, why didn't we expect this result? Um, you know, why this behavior that I'm talking about here for the black holes is really normal behavior. That's what ordinary systems should look like. Why didn't we see or, or can't we see similar saddle points or a competition of saddle points when I'm thinking about ordinary uh, physics for ordinary systems? And in fact, there's an example here that I'll give you that, that was discussed by these folks. Uh, I'm not sure if it's hidden on your screen, but you'll, you, I apologize uh, to Moshe Rizali, Mark Van Ramsdonk, uh, Jamie Sully, and I don't know who Waddell is, and, and uh, Wakeman, I guess the unnamed grad students. Apologies to them. Uh, but what you can do is you can think about a two dimensional CFT with a large central charge and a large number of degrees of freedom but we're going to say that there's a small number of uh, low dimension operators. So there's some caveats there. And Hartman uh, studied uh, this system using a conformal block expansion. And what he was interested in 
for rainy entropies for multiple intervals, and he was trying to understand this phase transition that we saw holographically. And in particular, what you can see for two intervals, where the endpoints are here given by these labels, is that there is a jump uh, in uh, the entanglement entropy, just like there is in holography. Um, but it's now a competition between two different saddles in different uh, OPE channels in this large C expansion. Now you can take that uh, large C CFT and you consider uh, um, thinking about uh, these correlators of twist operators, but instead of thinking about them in the plane, what we want to do is we want to think about them in the upper half plane with a flat uh, conformal boundary or a line uh, at the bottom. Um, it's straightforward to see, though, that this uh, correlator turns into a correlator of holomorphic uh, operators on the full plane. Uh, essentially, or almost, you can apply uh, Tom's expansion or Tom's analysis there, and you again find that there's a jump in the uh, entanglement entropy associated with this particular problem with the conformal uh, with the conformal boundary. Now, I can take that upper half plane. I can do a transformation that turns it into a cylinder. Uh, or a half cylinder, it's infinite in, uh, to the right, but there's a fixed boundary here, uh, circular boundary on the left. Um, I can think about the correlators of the twist operators here, uh, or I can do the transformation for the correlator uh, that we had in the upper uh, half plane. And what you find uh, by analytically continuing, again, if I cut that system, on the dotted line, what I've done is a path integral preparation of a thermal state of the CFT with the defect theory. And what that reveals is just the expected, uh, well, what we now call the page curve or the behavior uh, that we expected for the entanglement entropy. In particular, it begins by growing for a while, but then at a certain point, there's a jump to the other saddle and in that phase, uh, the, uh, the, um, the entropy is fixed. And so this is an example then where you, you're, again, you're looking at physics beyond holography or beyond uh, gravity physics, beyond black holes. And, and we're seeing the same kind of behavior where we're understanding the page curve with a competition of different uh, saddles, and it's clear that this is a large N effect, and it's not really something uh, that that really needed gravity at its essence. But I seem to have run out of time, so I'll just put my conclusions up there and end by saying, well, this is a, actually a very exciting time uh, to be thinking about the information uh, paradox, and there's uh, or non paradox now, and there's lots more to explore. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rob. You felt sometimes uh, underwhelming on these uh, platforms, but uh, you know, what can you do? Um, okay. Would anyone like to ask a question? Feel free, just unmute your mic and speak up. It's sort of first come, first serve, because I can't see hands. Hi, Rob. Hello. Oh, Roberto, hello. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, let me ask you one question about the, the construction, this uh, bulk construction that you had. So you had a hyperbolic ADS black hole, mm -hmm. which you slice uh, with a brain. Yeah. Now this, in principle, the black hole that you get on the brain, that's a hyperbolic ADS black hole as well, right? Yeah. But that doesn't have any back reaction from the CFT. Um, in in what sense does it have back reaction from or well, CFT? And, I mean, what I would have said is that what I did is I I I drew this picture. Can you see the yes. picture on the screen? Yes, yes. And I just drew this simple picture again, where I'm sticking the brain through the middle of the space. Yeah. 
but it, but again, the geometry now is is sort of expanded in the way that I I described before. So so the brain has back reacted. Um, yes, but this I, I'm not. That, but that, I'm what, not using words that say the CFT back reacts, but yeah. I'm not sure. Well, the, the geometry that you get on the brain, that's exactly a hyperbolic uh, black hole, right? Yeah. Without any corrections. I mean, it, you know that when you have a black hole localized on a Randall syndrome brain, typically you would get uh, corrections, a back reaction from the, from the CFT. So that's a black hole on the brain with a CFT coupled to it. It's CFT coupled to gravity. Oh, you want to know what is the expectation value of the CFT? That's zero on the brain. It's zero. Um, I think it's actually the the one that you expected because I all I've done is I've taken uh, the vacuum. I mean, this really is the vacuum case. Yes. And I've done a conformal transformation. Yes. To, to represent it. So I think in that coordinate transformation, what just like when you go from flat space to yes. Rindler space, you, you should see that effectively there's a stress tensor on the brain. Yeah, it's just the, the, the one that you get from the vial anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my question is actually that wouldn't you expect that there are other solutions that have the same boundary condition so you have a brain then you have you fix the temperature and then you would expect i think that there are other solutions which are more complicated than the one that you've shown us but these solutions may be dominant thermodynamically i mean um, I, uh, you, you, see, you see you see what i'm where i'm trying to go right i mean i mean it's a black hole black holes localized on the brain what you've done is the analog of a kind of a, the black string construction is extending into the bulk and there should be other solutions more like black droplets more localized on the brain which are dominant over the one that you that you that you've shown us just because the the, the temperature has been tuned I, I i i don't have a good argument but my intuition would be that in this case it isn't um, you know, we thought a little bit about if I tune the temperature slightly away from this, then the brain starts to bend and you do start to see the, you know, a, 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 a stress tensor that deviate. I mean, you get an, a, a condensate uh, where, where the, the, the CFT is condensing in the, in the vicinity of the horizon. Yeah. Um, but but you, I think what you're suggesting is that there are completely new saddles that are... Uh, yeah. In fact, we know about one, because okay. uh, it's uh, in the work that we did, you and I and uh, Gary Horowitz. You do this in an ADS4 bulk. The hyperbolic black hole that you get at the boundary, that's going to be a BTZ black hole. But then there's... You see what I'm... What I'm saying in four dimensions. No, 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 I know, but I think what you, I, I, I still think it's because the, tu the the temperature is tuned in this special way. But, but no, we should, we should. I, okay, the best I can say though is I, I, that's my intuition. I don't have a good argument, but we should look at it. I, I it's an interesting question. Okay, okay, maybe we can discuss it in private, uh, as we usually say. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Uh, this is Matt Hedrick. I mean, let's, let's say Roberto is right, and these are not thermodynamically stable. Does that matter for anything that you've done here? I mean, can't we still pose the um, information paradox the way you did uh, and consider, the, I mean, they're still valid solutions, right? They may, not, they may not be stable, but they will still last for a really long time, right? I mean, Oh, I see. You're saying these are semi or, or uh, they're not the dominant. Well, I think if they're not the dominant saddle in, you know, usually when you have a large M, they just don't contribute in a significant way. Um, well, but I mean, yeah, you have to create them. I mean, somebody would, they are I mean, not the thermodynamic yeah. equilibrium state, but 
but they're nonetheless valid, long-lived states. It's like asking if you have a small You're black saying I could, I could just do this path integral and prepare the state, and it would only decay away to Roberto's new solution over a very long time scale. Yeah, it's so, like asking about the black hole information paradox for a small black hole in ADS. I mean, you still okay. have that paradox, right? Those are good, yeah. still good solutions. No, as, as as long as we get get to the uh, page time uh, before, well, as long as the decay time is much much longer than the page time, yes, I'd agree. Let me say that I also agree that you, I mean, the analysis that you've done is fine. It's simply that I'm saying that there's there can be more to that. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So uh, I was a little bit confused about the discussion of whether the brain is part of the bulk or part of the boundary. Somewhere along there, I think you said that the boundary shouldn't be reconstructing other parts of the boundary. But I, I think that's sort of the point of, of these islands, that they're regions all within the same theory. And some part of the theory could reconstruct uh, another part of the theory, like inside the black hole. So I didn't quite understand why that was an argument that the brain should be part of the bulk. Um, it wasn't an argument that it should be a part of the bulk. If um, let me see. If, if we were just doing ordinary ADS, uh, I should have said hi Edgar, but if, if <laughs> we're just doing ordinary ADS CFT, um, yeah, and I'm doing uh, some kind of entanglement entropy calculation, if if I have uh, sort of this setup on the right. And I'm saying, well, I have these, you know, I have all the information that I want about the boundary degrees of freedom on the right hand side of the picture. I would not say that those degrees of freedom are going to tell me or, or that the information I have there is going to tell me how to reconstruct or do something, manipulate degrees of freedom on the left hand in the blue region on the left hand side right that that would be something complete that, that would just be nonsense according to the usual rules of ads cft right but there the entanglement wedge of the right doesn't contain the left i mean the thing you've drawn is entanglement wedge of the union of the two. Oh, sorry i guess your point is that right later maybe you could go to the later slide with it cutting through the brain i, I guess there the point was just the same right. picture <laughs> Uh, okay, right. sorry, so I was thinking more in terms of the older pictures, but I, I, I think I see what you mean. Yeah, so the point is that here, in, you, you wouldn't have even asked that question here. You would have just said, well, this brain physics is part of the bulk physics. And, and so when I have the information in the blue region, I can manipulate bits or reconstruct bits or, or information about the brain physics in, yeah, in the, I, yeah. on the right hand side. Yeah, I guess then my, yeah, so in the Z2 orbifold, I guess I was thinking in that context. Um, yeah. There. You know, in, in, in that context, you know, in that context, again, I, I think it's part of the bulk. And, and, and it could be that, you know, this message is coming too late to you. But, but I know in the early days, it was a, a question. You know, I, I'm drawing this picture that's now the, the, the one on the top of the slide. And, you know, the, the question was, is the Planck brain part of the boundary theory or is it part of the bulk theory? And so I'm just saying, we, sh you know, in, in this construction here, it's clear that, that the equivalent or the brain uh, where the gravity is, that's part of the bulk theory. That's, that's, a, that's the only point I was making. I wasn't arguing uh, that, yeah, I'm not sure what you were, I, 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 maybe I, confused you with something that was obvious. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Last chance, you might not see Rob in person for some number of months. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, in that case, uh, I know the applause is a little underwhelming, but let's uh, thank Rob again for uh, the very nice talk.
Thank you. Thank you, and stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, take care.